This is Ms. Angler, and we are going to be doing a members live revision lesson going off of the requests that I had seen in the comment section for this particular live. We're going to be focusing on the eye and genetics. Of course, you can always ask me other questions um, in the group chat as well. And don't forget to leave any kind of questions or comments that you may have in the actual chat so that I can see if you have any issues that you want me to cover, I can do that as well. But I feel like those were the two main topics that came across quite a bit. Um, some of the other topics I've already covered in our previous live, like homeostasis and the endocrine system. So I thought it would be a good idea to try... Um, do some other topics, um, especially do a little bit of a paper two topic as well. Uh, I know that we have paper one topics coming up first, but I think maybe doing a variety is also really important. Um, I'm just going to wait a couple more seconds just in case anyone else is going to join the live. Don't forget if you have missed any portion of the live or if you have to leave, that's okay because this gets uploaded onto my YouTube page and you'll be able to watch everything again later on. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to swap over to my notes and we're going to start off with the eye as requested. Um, now what I'm going to do is just do some very basic recapping on the structure of the eye and then I'm going to do some more like processes like accommodation, visual defects in your eye, that kind of thing. Okay, so First things first, in order to be really good at the eye, we need to know all of the structures and their functions. Now, some of the most key features in the eye is, of course, the lens, which is this structure over here. That is our lens. And an important characteristic about the lens is that it can change its shape. Now, this means that the lens is flexible. Uh, or elastic, if you want to refer to it that way as well. And being elastic and flexible ultimately means that we can change the shape of this. And I'm going to come back to later why it's important to change the shape of the lens. Um, then we've got the layers of the eye. So over here, we have the outer layer of the eye, the white layer, which is the sclera. The sclera is fibrous, so it is not um, able to change its shape. I have noticed in some textbooks and some people asking me, um, ma'am, the textbook says the sclera contracts and moves. Um, the sclera can't move. It's not a muscle. It's not a ligament. It's not attached to anything that's able to contract or relax. So that textbook that you may be using is a little bit outdated and it has poor information in it. The sclera is non-elastic so it can't actually move it's fibrous um sitting just below that layer is this dark maroon layer this is the choroid now um when we speak about the choroid uh the choroid is um this sort of like dark under layer um, that sits just underneath the sclera and it's filled with blood vessels and it basically makes the inside of your eye actually dark on the inside um, and we'll get to why it's important to have like darkness inside the eye shortly. And then last but not least, the sort of orangey layer over here, this is the retina. Now, the retina is um, where our receptors for seeing are found. And we have cones because they're shaped like a cone. And we have rods because they're shaped like rods. Um, but it's not just about their shape. It's also what they can see. So cones see color. I'm going to use the letter C for that. And rods actually see black and white, but not just black and white. They also see low um, light uh, level colors, if that makes sense. So you know, in the darkness, you would use your rods in your eye more often than you would in your cones. Your cones is what you would use in daytime vision when the light is really, really bright. Um, the next important uh, two structures here is this little indentation over there. That is called the yellow spot. Now, in some textbooks, it's also called the fovea. It can also be called the fovea maculae. Um, they're all correct, by the way. I'm just going to use the easy name, the yellow spot. And then this area over here where you actually see all of the blood vessels and this nerve exiting the eye, this is actually the blind spot. Now, what is the difference between the yellow and the blind spot? 
Well, the yellow spot is where the majority of these rods and cones are located. In other words, they are spread all the way around the inside of the retina, but this is their point of highest acuity. You may see that textbook um, sort of word a lot. Acuity means focus or strength. And so you have a lot of rod and cones there. The blind spot, on the other hand, is where the optic nerve leaves the eye. And so because the optic nerve leaves that area, you won't find any rods and cones in there. So I'm just going to put here no rods um, and cones. So that's ultimately why it's a blind spot. You can't actually see out of the blind spot. Then sort of moving into the front of our eye over here, we've got our lens, as I mentioned to you earlier. Now the lens can actually change shape, and I am going to go over that when we look at accommodation. But attaching the lens in place are these long string-like structures called the suspensory ligaments. Now the suspensory ligaments are there to change the shape of the lens. And what that means is we either want to make the lens fatter or we want to make it skinnier or thinner or flatter. And this change in the lens shape allows us to see far away or close up. And we're going to talk about that soon when I go over accommodation. Um, just below the suspensory ligaments, which is the sort of maroon darker area down here. I know my labels are overlapping a bit now, but that over there is called the ciliary muscle. Um, it's also called the ciliary body as well. Um, it's called the ciliary body because it, that's like the whole structure. The actual thing, the whole thing is called the ciliary body, but um, the muscles in the ciliary body are ultimately what pulls on the suspensory ligaments or what relaxes, um, and that affects uh, the shape of your lens. So in order to change the shape of your lens, which again, we will go over again later, but you need the ciliary body and the suspensory ligaments. Those two things ultimately change the shape of this lens here. And the last little bit in terms of the front of the eye, we have got the pupil, which is this opening over here into your eye. That's where light enters. We have the iris, which is the colorful part of your eye. Um, and then, and this is a tricky one because a lot of people don't know the bulgy bit in the front here. That is our cornea. And um, we often confuse it with the conjunctiva. The conjunctiva is the thin black line on the edge here. Like, see this little thin line here? That would be the conjunctiva. That would be where all of the nerve endings are for pain. The cornea is this front uh, sort of bulgy bit out here. And it's really important that it is there because this bulgy bit out there is where a lot of light is refracted. Now, before I move on to any processes in the eye, I'd love for you to put some um, comments in the chat. And so I'm sorry if it's a bit shaky. I'm just going to move... The camera over just a little bit because I can't see the comments otherwise. So let's have a look. All right, Sangeeta so asks, can you also explain the difference between the ciliary muscle and, and the circular muscle? Absolutely, that's a very common mistake. I will do that. I often confuse these because we use them in accommodation. Yes, okay, don't worry, Sangeeta. I'm going to clarify that too. Um, and then somebody else asked here, ma'am, please also share practice questions. Um, I think what you're asking me there is what kind of questions we can practice. Um, so what I'm going to do, everybody, for you in terms of practice questions is I'm going to um, make a video for you on some practice questions on the eye as well. Um, and I can, um, what's the word? I can post that for you as a member's video if you like, so you can watch me answer some questions on the eye. I have another question. Hey, miss, relating to the eye, um, what is absent in a person with only one eye? Oh, like what can't they see? Oh, that's a lovely question. Um, that's Tsepo asking that question. Um, Tsepo, if you have one eye, you lack binocular vision. So let me just answer your question. So when you have two eyes, so just imagine these are your eyes, and you're going to look at an object. So let's say a tree, for example. 
If you have two eyes, your field of vision leaves both eyes like this and they overlap. This gives you the three dimension of vision. It gives you the height of the object you are looking at. It gives you the length. And it also gives you the depth. So like how far away it is from you. And when you only have one eye, which means we remove one eye, you actually remove binocular vision. So having two eyes like this means you have binocular vision. So if you take away one eye, you lose your binocular vision. And what it ultimately means is you can't actually see in these three um, dimensions. That's why we see things in 3D, because you can see their height, their width, and their breadth, which means you can see how tall, wide, and deep they are. And so when you take away one of your eyes, you actually lose the depth perception, which means you struggle to see how far away things are from you and their shape. Um, and so that's actually a great question. It would be a great exam question too if they had asked something like that. Now, getting back to the processes in the eye, I'm just going to quickly remove all of this off my eye so I can actually use it to explain accommodation, papillary mechanism, and clear up Singita's uh, confusion around the ciliary muscle and the uh, ciliary body. So let's start off with um, the sorry, the circular muscle, I beg your pardon, and the um, ciliary body, because we get those confused. So I'm going to explain to you the pupillary mechanism first. I'm going to start with that one, because that's a bit easier. And so as I mentioned earlier, here is the pupil. It is the hole into the eye, and you can see just behind here is the lens. Now, we are trying to get the light from the outside of the eye into the back of the eye. Specifically, we want the light to land here. Now, the thing is, your eyes are very sensitive to light, so we want to limit the amount of light that actually enters the eye. We don't want too much or too little. You know, we want to be like just right. So to do this, we use the pupil, which is this opening over here, and we make it bigger or smaller. And to do that, we use the iris. Now, the iris is a muscle. And it is made up of two smaller muscles put together. So I'm going to sketch those for you down here. So we are on the same page. If I'm looking directly at your eye, so this is your iris. This is the hole. Over here is your pupil. So I'm just going to color it in black so we know that that is the pupil. There are two sets of muscle that make up the iris. You have circular muscles which, as it suggests, goes around. So these are the circular muscles. And then you have radial muscles, which go out like this. They radiate. Kind of like, I like to think of it like the sun radiates, it goes out. So these are your radial muscles. Now, they work in partnership to make your eye bigger, uh, sorry, not your eye, your pupil bigger and smaller. So, first of all, how do we know who does what? Well, this is how I remember it, everyone. For radial muscles, which are these muscles over here, I like to think of them as a blind. And if you have blinds on your windows at home, you'll understand what I mean. You have the blind where the like wooden or metal pieces sit like parallel to one another like this. And if I want to make the light come in to the window, I lift the blind up. I pull on a string and all of these little flat pieces of metal or wood stack on top of each other and they go to the top of the window. And the radial muscle does exactly the same thing. They pull upwards. They pull this way. Which means the pupil, if I pull on the radial muscles, will get bigger. So it is the radial muscle that is responsible for making the pupil bigger. But the thing is, if the radial muscle is contracting, the circular muscles must relax. And they work in opposite with one another. 
Now, if you need an extra note on this to make it easy to remember, don't forget it is in the study guide that as a member you do have access to if you're a Rescue Me member and you can request access to your copy of your study guide. All you have to do is find it under the community page for members under C Perks Info. And then you just send a request and I generally give you access within two days. It just depends because I get a lot of emails and requests about how quickly I can open all of them and confirm it's you as well. But anyway, this explanation is really clear in my study guide. I've given you a nice, easy way to remember it. So I'm not going to write everything down. That's where you can come in and learn that. But essentially, if I want to make the pupil bigger, I lift the radials. So they lift up. I want you to imagine like a blind, I'm lifting these up and the pupil gets bigger. And the reason why we want to, that to happen is we are going to use the radial muscles to contract, particularly when we are in the dark, because we want more light to go into your eye. Now, if we go into, just going to undo some of my drawing. If we want to go into bright light, right? So we're stepping out of a dark space. Like let's say we've been watching a movie and we're going to go inside. Uh, sorry, we're going to go outside, right? So this is how my drawing was roughly before, okay? It's now the circular muscle's job to do the changing of the size of the pupil. So remember the circular muscles go all the way around the opening like that. And I want you to imagine them as like, you know, when you focus a camera and you twist the camera lens to make it bigger or smaller, that's what you're doing. In this sense, though, you are making the pupil smaller. So when the circular muscles contract, the pupil is going to get much, much smaller. So I'm going to make this pupil smaller like that. And that is because these circular muscles have contracted. And that means the circular muscles are doing all the work in very bright light. They are the ones that are contracting and they contract inwards. So the circular muscles move inwards and they are the ones that make your pupil smaller. Now that is the pupillary mechanism. And to clarify for Singita who'd asked that particular question, that's where she often gets the word circular muscle confused with. It's because you mentioned circular muscles here, and then in accommodation, which we'll do next, you use ciliary muscles. And I understand it's the it's the S, it's the C sound, right? Like circular and ciliary, they're often the ones that we confuse together. Now I'm just gonna have a quick look at our chat before I go on to accommodation. Uh, Ms. Tepo says, in the SACI trial exams, one of the questions we had today was, if an eye cannot constrict, what does it affect and how do we solve? How do we solve? I understand it affects pupillary mechanisms, but how can it be solved? The eye cannot contract. Oh, the, I just want to ask um, Ms. Tepo for your question. Did they say the eye cannot constrict or the pupillary um, body can't, like that's not happening? I just want to clarify your question because your eye, your whole eye, like this structure can't constrict, but the iris can because it's made up of muscles. So I just want you to clarify for the, me in the in the chat what you, they meant in that question. Um, oh, the pupil can't constrict. Okay, great. So basically, if I reread your question from earlier, it says that today the eye cannot, the pupil cannot constrict. Um, how does it affect the pupil? Yeah, so basically, yes, you would have answered that correctly because if the pupil can't constrict, right? So in other words, if I go down here, if this doesn't happen, then you will let too much or too little light in, just depending on the scenario they had given you. Because, for example, if I step into very bright sunlight and the circular muscles don't contract, meaning they make my pupil smaller, if they don't do that, too much light will go into my eye. So if I go up here, I'll show you. Too much light will go into the eye. It will go through my big pupil, which I don't want to have in very bright light. And it will stimulate all of the rods and cones in the back here 
but it will actually hurt my eye and it will cause like a pain recepting response. So if the pupil doesn't get bigger or smaller, too much light is let into the eye. And if too much light is let into the eye, we often experience pain and it's like glary, you know, like very bright, like you, you, you want to try and close your eyes. And it's the same for the opposite. If the pupil can't get bigger in the dark, you won't be able to see very well in the dark either. Okay, I hope that clarifies everything. I'm going to move on to accommodation now because that's often the most confusing one for us is accommodation. It's kind of the sister to... Um, to the papillary mechanism and it's often the one that we confuse with one another so let's do the basics around accommodation so again for accommodation i need to talk about the lens i need to talk about the suspensory ligaments and i need to talk about the ciliary body so these three structures over here but instead of just using this picture i'm going to draw them below here to make it a little bit easier so first things first this ciliary muscle body structure thing at the top here that I drew, or should I say pointed out earlier, it's actually circular. But remember, you can't see a circle when you cut it, you know, in half. You can only see the top half of the circle and the bottom. But I want you to know that this goes the whole way around. So what you're seeing here is the ciliary muscle. That's what this is. And attached to the ciliary muscle is going to be our suspensory ligaments. So these guys, and they go all the way around. Again, you're probably looking at the top picture from earlier thinking, how do they like go all the way around? It doesn't look like they do that. It looks like they're just on the top or the bottom. Remember, I can't show you them how they go all the way around because they would get in the way. So I'm just drawing this now from the front so you can see all of them. And then attached to all of these suspensory ligaments are my, or is, should I say, my lens. I'm just going to make these a bit longer so they touch my lens. Okay. All right. So this is what my eye looks like. I've got, I'm just going to put your SL for suspensory ligaments. And this is the lens. Okay. So let's do some basics about seeing and how we see. Now, the eye, or the lens, needs to be able to change its shape so that you can see far or close up. And the reason for that is the amount of light going into the eye. Again, if I reference this picture from earlier, it's all about how much light is going into your eye and getting to this back spot over there, right? So essentially what we want to be able to do is we want to change the shape of the lens. Now here is the natural shape of the lens. It's what we would call convex in shape, so it bulges outwards. And we want to be able to make it more or less convex. Now the natural state of the eye, so the natural state when your eye is actually at rest, is actually when you are looking at things very far away. And so what I'm telling you is distance vision is when your eye is actually at most restful, at its most restful state. And that means that not much is actually happening inside of the eye. It's when you look down at a piece of paper or your cell phone, or you're looking up from the school board down to your book again and back and forth, that your eye is actually doing a lot of work on the inside, changing the size and the shape of your lens. Now, again, there is a lovely page on this in my um, study guide that you can reference everybody. But just to walk you through it, if I am looking at something that is more than six meters away from me, I am going to be using um, these structures in my eye to change the shape of my lens. So when I'm looking far away, my ciliary muscles, I'm just going to put them as CMs, they are going to relax. So this band of muscle around the edge here relaxes. But when it relaxes, the opposite thing happens to the suspensory ligaments. And these two also work together. Um, they work together to change the shape. If the ciliary muscle relaxes, then our suspensory ligand, sorry, ligaments, they pull taut. 
Um, and when we say taut, everybody, taut means like tight. Okay, so they pull tight. So what happens is this lens goes, I just want to show you. So if it goes from this, it'll get fatter and more rounder like that. That's what we want. And that's when we're looking for far away vision. Now the next, oh, sorry, not fatter. I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon. It's not fatter. Oh, now I've covered, um, removed everything. Now let me just change my eraser. Here we go. doesn't get fatter. I beg your pardon. If we're pulling, if the suspensory ligaments are pulling on the lens, the lens is going to be flatter. So now what happens is we're going from, that's what I wanted to show you, this bulgy lens, and we are trying to make it thinner and like flatter like that. So it's sort of like we're pulling on it, making it flat, relaxing, making it fat, pulling on it, making it thin, pushing and relaxing and letting it get fatter. And this is what allows more or less light into the eye to be refracted in this case Refraction is going to decrease. Now, ma'am, what is refraction? Refraction is the bending of light, um, which basically means when I say bending of light, um, I mean, oh, I can't spell. Sorry, I'm talking and trying to spell at the same time. Um, when you're trying to bend light, it you're trying to focus it on the back of the eye. The thing is with the laws of light and the laws of physics, um, light will travel in a straight line, so in a straight line, um, until it moves through a different medium. So if your eye is here and light is moving towards it like this in a straight line, the moment it goes into your eye, which is a different substance to air, it actually bends the light and the the light goes into a different direction. And that is good, actually, because we need it to do that so we can see clearly. Um, and getting back to my explanation here on accommodation, the lens gets thinner, which means, or flatter, which means their refraction is less. So the bending of the light is less. And you end up with a nice, clear image of what you are looking at. Now, just for the sake of studying, everybody, I hope you know that you can just learn one of these and then write it in the opposite. So what that means is you can learn the plus six vision. And then for near vision, when you're like explaining how you see when you read a book, you just write this in the opposite. So if this was um, less than six meters, you would say the ciliary muscles contract. The suspensory ligaments um, slacken. The lens becomes more convex or it becomes fatter, more bulgy. Refraction increases and there is still a clear image at the back of the eye. So what I like to do is to study smarter, not harder. You don't need to spend hours trying to remember both. If you remember one really well, you just write the opposite of that. Um, now I'm just thinking about the way in which they love asking this. So I'm going to definitely say to you, everybody, that they love accommodation and the papillary mechanism. They love asking those questions. So be prepared to answer them. Often they like as little story. They'll say like, Miss Angler is reading a book and she looks up to see a, a bird flying towards her. Describe the changes in the eye that will occur so that she can see the bird clearly. Now, the bird is far away from me. So um, that means that I need to use my distance vision, right? So I'm going to use this vision over here. Um, and I'm reading a book. So I'm starting from close up. And now I'm looking far away. So I need to describe basically these points over here. And that's, that's really the best way um, I can explain how they're going to ask this. Okay, um, don't forget, if you'd like anything to be asked, if you want to ask me anything, you're more than welcome to put it in the chat. Um, the very, very last thing I'm going to do about eyes and revision on eyes is visual defects in the eye before we go on to some genetics. 
Okay, so as I mentioned to you earlier, the goal of vision is to put the focal point uh, of your vision over here. In other words, you want the highest point of light moving through the eye and ending up over there. The problem is that if the lens is the wrong shape or the eyeball itself is actually the wrong shape, light can end up trying to focus here in the middle of nowhere, or it can try and focus beyond the eye. Now, don't misunderstand what that means. I don't mean that light magically moves through your solid structures and, and tries and focuses behind your eyes. What it basically means is, is that when the light comes into your eye, it either focuses too early, or if the light moves through your eye, it never focuses because it just ends up at the like so far at the back that as you can see here, it doesn't come to a point. It's still got two points that haven't come down to one. And now that is what we call myopia and hypermetropia, which is basically how your eye focuses light incorrectly. So I'm going to start off with the first one. And I'm going to explain it to you. So I'm going to just remove the one so we can focus on one at a time. Keeping in mind that this is normal vision. So this is normal. That's where we want this to land versus when the focal point lands in front of the yellow spot. We call this myopia. Myopia also means short-sightedness. It means you can only see close up. And we describe people's sightedness by what they can do. So if I say I'm short-sighted, I can see close up. So now here's the problem. People with myopia, their focal point ends up in front of the retina, in front of the yellow spot over here. So we have to correct this. So how do we correct this? Well, the first thing is we the lens is not able to change shape correctly. In other words, at this point, the problem is the lens is too convex, so too bulgy like this. And I'm just going to write here myopia just so we can compare later. So the lens is too convex. It can also be, by the way, not just the lens. It can also be the cornea. So this outside layer, this like thick white layer, it can also be too bulgy like this. Now to fix this, in other words, what must we add to fix this problem is you are going to wear a pair of glasses that are concave which is quite interesting because you don't actually notice it being concave when you look at people with glasses, but their lenses are concave. And so if this is your natural um, eye lens, then this is what the glasses or the um, contact lenses must look like. They must be concave. Now, the opposite happens when you have vision that is long-sighted. So let's get rid of the myopia. When your vision point tries to focus, but it actually ends up just focusing beyond your eye. So as light comes into the eye, it actually skips over and ends up focusing at the back here. This is called hypermetropia. And hypermetropia is long-sightedness. It means people who can see far away, but not close up. Now, a lot of your, maybe your mom's dads and grannies and grandpas, they have hypermetropia, which means they have to wear glasses to read, right? So hypermetropia is when the focal point is beyond the eye. Now, if we compare to myopia, and we compare the lens shape, You'll see the difference now. It's actually just the opposite. The problem is, is that when you have hypermetropia, your lens is quite skinny and flat. So you can't actually change its shape successfully. And we need to fix this problem. So what we do is we add a pair of glasses that have a bulgy lens to them that is more convex and we fix the problem. And so if you compare the two side by side, it actually, it genuinely is just the opposite of one another, um, except this is a little more sunken in, like a little more concave, 
um, and I'm just going to write the word concave so you can actually compare concave um, to convex. I'll write convex over here. This is a convex lens. This is a concave lens. Same with hypermetropia. It's not as concave, but it's definitely skinnier. And we need to put a convex lens on someone. And that's also why you've noticed maybe in your parents' glasses, or maybe you wear glasses, you'll notice that in someone's glasses, if like this is the front part where, and there's the nose piece, and there's their other glasses, they have like an extra piece of like thick, bulgy glass down here that is for their hypermetropia it's so they can read things close up now last but not least before I go on to genetics because this is one a lot of grade 12s forget to study so I actually love mentioning it because I love to sort of like help you out as much as possible is something called astigmatism Now, astigmatism in this picture, like what would you look for? Astigmatism is when you end up with two focal points, which is massively, like that's a massive problem. If you have two focal points in the back of your eye like this, so you've got a focal point there and a focal point there, you have something called astigmatism. And generally, you have astigmatism from the day you're born. Okay, so day one, you'll have astigmatism. And the issue is generally the lens, yet again, or the cornea, is misshapen. Um, often it's a little more um, rugby ball shaped um, than it is round. That's the problem, your eye. And so your lens and cornea have a weird shape. And you end up having two focal points in your eye, which is, a, is already problematic. So what you have to do is also wear corrective lenses. But again, for the final exam, you don't need to know the name of the corrective lens. You just need to know that there are two focal points in the back of the eye. Okay, I'm just going to quickly look at our group chat. Sunita asks, myopia, short-sightedness or hypermetropia? Oh, myopia. So I'll just write it out for you here. Myopia. That is short-sightedness and hypermetropia is long-sightedness. In other words, if you have myopia, you can see close up, short. Hypermetropia, you can see long or far away. Okay, alrighty then. I'm going to move on to some genetics and... Um, Please, by all means, give me some direction on what you want to do in, ge in genetics because it's a very long topic. It's like one of the biggest, oops, one of the biggest sections that we do. So I don't want to go over a whole bunch of stuff that maybe we don't want to hear about. But I'm going to start on a part of the genetics that you probably always get wrong. Uh, or you, or let's say you don't always get it wrong. Let's rather say you forget to study it because I sometimes feel like that is um, a grade twelve's biggest flaw is they overlook studying certain things. So I'm just going to quickly do a quick revision on um, genetics and genetic modification. Um, it's just a subsection on genetics. If you want me to do any other genetic topics, quickly pop them in the chat, um, like crosses, pedigrees, that kind of thing, and I can also do those. Um, so there are actually two types of cloning in genetics you have to know. And the first one is molecular cloning. Oh, I'm already spelling this wrong. Me molecular cloning. And the other one is going to be reproductive cloning, but I'm going to do molecular cloning first. And if you're sitting there going, I don't remember us having to learn this. Well, yes, you do need to know it. You first learned it in grade 12, um, but um, your teacher may or may not have gone over it again, but you do need to know it. So what is molecular cloning? Basically, molecular cloning is when you want to clone a substance generally. In other words, you don't want to grow a whole animal or a whole plant just so you can collect the pollen, or just so you can collect the um, hormone that the plant makes. You just want the substance. You don't want the whole structure. So this is what we do. Step one, we get ourselves a bacterial cell. Generally, we use E. coli. They are the most common 
form of bacteria we use for this. And inside E. coli is this little ring of DNA called a plasmid. And plasmids are really, really, really useful because we can edit them. They're simple to extract um, and they don't affect the functioning of the bacterial cell at all. So what we do is we take the plasmid and we remove it. And the plasmid is a piece of DNA. It's a circular piece of DNA, which even makes it even better because we can't really break it. We can just cut out a piece and stick it back together again, which is great. And that's exactly what we do. We take restriction enzymes and we cut a piece of the plasmid DNA out. So we remove that and you end up with like a half a ring like that with a piece missing. Then what we do is, let's say I want to make um, human insulin, which is the most common one we have um, in our textbooks. And over here, this red line represents um, the insulin gene. I've taken this out of a human. So all I do is I come along and I'm going to insert it into the plasmid. So I'm going to stick it in here and I do that with um, restriction enzymes. So enzymes both cut and paste. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this newly modified ring of DNA, which we now call recombinant DNA or recombinant plasmids. That's a recombinant plasmid. It's recombined. That's why we change its name. We put it back into our bacteria. And the bacteria doesn't know that that little bit of DNA doesn't belong to it. It just thinks, oh, I've got a new piece of DNA inside me. I guess that should be here. And it goes on to replicate. And what it starts to do is it reads this gene and it goes, oh, I must make insulin. So it starts making insulin and it actually secretes it out in like liquid form. And it collects in big containers, like we do this with millions of bacteria. And the insulin literally leaks out of them. And we collect that insulin and we use it for human diabetics. Um, and if you ask me, well, is there any bacterial DNA in the insulin? No, there's not. Um, is there bacteria in the actual insulin? No, there's not. It gets purified once we're done. So this is the sort of process, once again, that we need to know. And um, again, I've got a great summary page on this in my um, study guide. So that's molecular cloning. That's my last little bit of revision on that. And then the last bit before I look at all of our comments and questions and anything we want me to go over again is I'm going to do reproductive cloning. This one is the one we use in genetics when we want to make a whole organism. So the one I did just now is for substances. Reproductive cloning is for if I want a whole sheep or I want a whole horse, okay? So generally what happens is uh, we'll have sheep A and we've got sheep B. Now let's say sheep A makes a lot of wool, high quality wool, and we want to make more sheeps like that. Sheep B doesn't make good wool, but she's a good mother. In other words, she's got healthy eggs. Um, she can ha She's had babies before. And so she's a good um, person to help us clone. So what we do is out of sheep A, I will take out a somatic cell. Let's just make my nucleus bigger. That's my somatic cell. And remember, somatic cells come from anywhere in the body. Muscle, bone, skin. We won't take it from the gametes because we want somatic cells to be diploid, and that's important. Why? Because diploid means it has all the chromosomes in it. They're whole. In sheep B, however, we're also going to take a cell out of it, but this time we're going to take a ovum. And ovums are haploid, which means they have half the chromosome number that we need. Now what we need to do is we want to clone sheep A. So we take out the nucleus and we keep the nucleus, right? On this sheep, we don't want the nucleus. We just want the egg because this sheep A, um, sorry, this sheep B, I beg your pardon, has proved to be a very healthy mother with healthy eggs. So we want her healthy egg, but with no nucleus. So we, we take the nucleus out. 
We then combine the two together and we put the nucleus into this empty cell, which we call a gutted cell because we've removed a part of it, so it's called gutted. We give a little electric shock. So there's a bit of a shock. And the shock is like fertilization. It pretends fertilization has happened when it hasn't. And we then allow for mitosis to occur, which means we take this one cell and we turn it into two, and those two become four and eight and 16 and so on. And, none, and now one of the most common questions in genetics is, well, we go through this whole process who is the baby going to be a clone of? Is it going to be a clone of A or is it going to be a clone of B? And hopefully we already know that the clone is most definitely going to be sheep A. And it's going to be sheep A because sheep A gave the nucleus, right? Sheep B gave an empty cell. Okay, so the empty cell is... Um, gutted and there's nothing that it con can contribute to the, the um, sheep's genetics. Why do we do this? Humans do this because we like beneficial animals. We like the products they make. So we like to see how much, um, like how much or how well, should I say, we can grow organisms. Like do they make a lot of milk? Do they make a lot of wool? We do this in plants as well. Do they make a lot of fruit? So we can use reproductive cloning um, for all of that. Okay, I'm going to have a look in our comment section to see what we want to cover. Okay, Kuna, you, are we expected to state Mendel's law? So Kuna wants to know, um, do we need to state the laws? Yes, you do. There are three laws in genetics, everybody. I hope you know all three of them because you have to be able to state them. I'm just going to list them for you in case you don't know your genetic laws. So the three laws are the law of dominance, which basically means dominant alleles are, or should I say not dominant alleles, um, traits that are dominant dominate over recessive alleles. So in other words, you'll always see the dominant over the recessive. The second law is the law of segregation. And segregation is the idea that when you um, make an egg uh, and a sperm cell um, and they fuse together, you can only inherit one allele from each parent. In other words, this sperm cell is going to carry one allele and this egg cell is going to carry one allele. So when they come together, you only end up getting one allele from each parent. So the law of segregation is that when forming gametes, alleles separate into separate gametes. Therefore, you can only inherit one allele from each parent. If you want me to elaborate further on that, what I mean by that is, if my alleles are big A, small A, when I make eggs, these two alleles must separate. They cannot stay in the same egg cell. That basically is what segregation is. And that's very useful for when we do pedigrees. And the third and final law is the law of independent assortment. Now, this one is very misunderstood and often misused. The law of independent assortment. And to be honest, a lot of textbooks don't write it very well. And maybe even some teachers don't really know how to explain it very well. But this is the easiest way to know the difference. The law of independent assortment is based off the fact that your eye color, so let's say it's blue, is not linked to, for example, your blood group. In other words, you inherit them separately. So if you had blue eyes and your blood group was blood group AB, those two things are not linked together. They are independently assorted. In other words, just because a person has blue eyes doesn't mean they will have the blood group AB. These two traits are independent of one another. They are not attached. 
Um, and so when do we see this? the most often, because a lot of people don't know when to apply this rule, we often use this rule for dye hybrids. And we see it in dye hybrids because often that's when we're doing these kinds of crosses, right? Like we've got a tall plant that's purple. Those are two traits, tall or height and color. The height and color, they're not married together. In other words, you don't have to be tall to be purple. You can be tall and white. Likewise, the other way around, you don't have to be purple to be tall. So you can be white and short, or you can be white, uh, purple and short. The two characteristics or the alleles are not married together. The last bit of advice I will give you on genetics and knowing your laws is that you must know them off by heart from your um, guideline, please. Don't use the ones in your textbooks. They're mostly wrong or poorly worded. All right, Seppo wants to know, can I please explain genetic modification and Mendel's laws? Um... I think Tsepo I just did, but I think maybe that's because it's a delay in the in the questions as well for genetic modification. Genetic modification was when I did now the molecular cloning and the reproductive cloning. That is genetic modification. So I think I've covered that for you already. And then another question, Singita, on a pedigree diagram, when labeling a effective person, we have to write XX or XY and the disease or the disease without the XX and XY. Okay, so first things first, Sunita, and for everyone else listening, up to pedigrees. First things first, this is important. Not all pedigree diagrams are sex-linked. Just because there are boys and girls in the picture doesn't automatically mean that we are talking about a sex-linked disorder, okay? So what I mean is just because the disorder has, or should I say the diagram has men and women in it, it doesn't mean automatically, oh, it must be sex-linked. How do you know it's sex-linked? Well, in the little paragraph at the top, it will say it is X with a capital A, a little H next to it, or it'll say X with a little T, but the clue is that. If they don't actually say this is sex-linked, then it's not sex-linked, everybody. It's an autosomal disorder, like, for example, albinoism, and that will just be represented like this. So let me use this as an example to answer Singita, right? I'm going to use albinoism. This is a family of people, and I'm going to use albinoism. So I'm just going to... color in these individuals and I'm going to tell you what the key is now. Um, let's see and let's do this. Okay. So this is my pedigree diagram. My key, the people who are colored in, they have albinoism, which means they don't make melanin. Okay, so to answer Singita's question, albinoism is an autosomal disorder. So you either use a big letter or a small letter on its own like that. There's no X's and Y's in this one. It's not a sex-linked cross. Only if it tells you it's a sex-linked cross. So let's say hypothetically if I worked out these parents up here, the mom has albinoism, which means she must be two small A's because it's a recessive disorder to have albinoism. And uh, the dad doesn't have it, so he must have at least one capital A. We need to figure out his other letter, but we can see they have a child with albinoism. And the only way that's possible is for the dad to have another small A over there because that small A and that small A come together to make him. And that, everybody, is the law of segregation working. We've got these children over here, which are also unaffected, but they're going to get their capital letter from their dad because they don't have it. And mom only has small letters to offer like that. Now we've got this child over here and we've got this unaffected person over here. Um, I'm actually assuming her other letters, so let's not do that because 
let's not assume that just yet. So we know she's unaffected, so are her parents, but now what are their other letters? Well, the fact that they have a son that has albinoism, which is this, they must both have two small letters to give to their son. Now she, the daughter, if you understand this next bit, it would be fantastic if you did, is she could have a capital letter from both parents, or she could also be a big letter from one parent and a small letter from the other, and that would be okay because she still ended up with um, uh, she still ended up with not having uh, any anybody else, like any any um, albinoism. Um, but now the clue to determine which one is which is um, we need to look at her children. Now her children don't have the disorder, and the only way that is possible is if the dad gave a small A to both of them and each of them have a big A from their mom. Again, it doesn't actually help us very much because um, she could be this or she could be this. Now, I know I'm going about this a very long way to explain, but I'm trying to just show you that not all pedigree diagrams are X and Y linked. Some of them are autosomes where we just do this. If, however... Let's just do hemophilia because that's such a nice, easy, simple one to explain. A simple tree here. Dad's got hemophilia. Okay. That means if we're doing hemophilia, we're going to use X with a little h, X with a capital H. And so here, dad would be X little h, Y. Mom would be X, X. She's unaffected, so... She's going to have a capital H and her son is unaffected, which means she's either two capital H's or she could actually be a carrier too. Her children aren't telling us very much. The dad, on the other hand, well, he can give his son the Y and because the boy doesn't have the disorder, he must have a capital H. On this side, the girl gets her um, X from her dad. So one of her X's must have a small H, which means she's a carrier. And now, because she doesn't have hemophilia either, the other X must have a capital H on it that she gets from her mom. So that's all about like the law of segregation. So why am I doing all of this hard work to show you maybe something? Because Sangeeta is asking, on a pedigree diagram, when labeling an affective person, we have to write the XX and the XY uh, and the disease or the disease without the Xs and XYs. My first thing is not all pedigrees are sex linked. Some can be autosomal like this. That's an autosomal disorder. Some can be sex linked. And then you must use an X and a Y when you are explaining yourself in pedigrees. But wait, there's another question from Sangeeta. She says, so in autosomal, it's letters without the X and Y. In sex links, it is. Yes, confirmed. 100%. This is autosomal with just the letters on its own. This is with the X and the Y, which is the sex-linked disorders. The last teeny tiny bit that we're going to do that's linked to this, which is quite a nice way to wrap this lesson up because it will link in with all of this that we've just done now with sex-linked disorders, is the following. When you are writing out your genetic cross, so you're doing like P1, and now you're going to write out the parents, everybody. Um, you are going to have to go, let's say we're doing hemophilia. If you are doing hemophilia, you must write male with hemophilia. I'm not going to write out the whole thing. It's going to take up too much space. And then below that, you write his X and his Y with the little small H on there. Okay. The male is really important. Please do not mix these up. Please don't write here male with X, H, Y. You know what I mean? Like don't mix these two together. We're going to keep those separate. So if I wrote it out in full, it would look something like this. I've got my P1 generation and I've got male with hemophilia times, let's say, a female 
um, who is unaffected. So she's without hemophilia. But I'm going to throw an interesting curveball. I'm going to call her a carrier. You'll notice I've put carrier in brackets, and that's really, really important because you actually want the marker to ignore the word carrier. The word carrier is just for you. So you remember that she's carrying the disorder. So now when we write the alleles out, we've got the male with the disorder. There's the disorder there. And we've got the female who's a carrier, which remember is just for you to remember that one of her X's has a capital H and one of her little, uh, one of her X's has a small H. And that's like my little top, like tip and hint is this little bit here. By putting it in a bracket, you meet, you allow the marker to ignore it, which is a good thing. Because it's just so that you don't forget. Because if you just normally write female unaffected, you might fall into the trap of making her like this. Two X's with two capital H's. Because this girl here is also unaffected. But that's not the kind of girl we want to work with. We want to work with a carrier girl because she's got a big letter and a small letter. Now, I'm going to check the chat in case there's anything else that anyone's asked me. It doesn't look like it. And I think we've had quite a long lesson today, a full hour today, going over genetics and our the, uh, the eye. Um, I'm definitely going to be having another lesson next week. I know many of you have already started prelims or you're starting like either Monday or, or, or maybe even the week after that if, you're, if, you've, if, if your school starts a bit later with prelims. But we are going to be having lots of prelim uh, prep as well. Don't forget to look out onto your members page um, for new videos I'm posting. And don't forget, members, to also look at your members-only video list. You have your own playlist of videos as well that are separate from the public videos. So don't forget to go and watch those too. And I'm going to say thank you for everybody that joined today. And you can go back and watch this. It'll be uploaded shortly. And um, I hope it was helpful. And I will see you all again soon. Bye.